Another episode of Loving Table Talks, where I am your host, Peter. Well, well, well. Actually, Peter. Um, I'm the Peter. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter. I'm the Peter that's supposed to be hosting thine talk show. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter, and welcome back. Uh. Uh. No, I'm the Peter. I'm the Peter that's supposed to be hosting the talk show. All right. So, welcome back to another episode of Gloving Table Talks, where I'm your host, Peter. Wait, but I'm the paradigm. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, huh. What do you mean? Okay, well, I guess Multiverse, you're the... Multiverse. Metaverse. <laughs> Maybe we're all Peter, but... I guess I guess it's it's cool because we have a bunch of different generations of Peter than huh. <laughs> I, I guess yeah. so. Some of them are all the around the same states. year. <laughs> yeah. So t- so today I think what we want to talk about is just I guess kind of highlight all the different generations that exist within gloving, and those generations we can compare alongside the same timeline as like. How the gaming culture has gone interestingly enough like it's something that me and peter and the rest of us just talked about and it's kind of interesting and then we can talk about the differences between like competitive and casual and then online versus irl gloving but yeah so josh oh i want you to start josh oh thank you uh peter um <laughs> So, I think an interesting place for us to start today. Um, let's just do like a quick kind of like general recap. And also, you know, this is just me being incredibly brief. You know, people can say that gloving originally started in like subcultures and like SoCal, right? And then at some point, it eventually like expanded out as it was gaining more popularity um, throughout the u.s um eventually making its way towards you know certain places outside of the u.s um and at the same time during that timeline you also saw the rise of two things in my opinion uh one is the online scene right you know primarily focused in uh facebook and gl but you know you also had these other pockets like reddit twitter instagram and then the second thing i would say is regions you had like different geographical regions usually associated with places that had a base scene um but sometimes you know not sometimes there were just like you know what i live in uh somewhere uh i found this thing i introduced it to certain people and ended up clicking there um just because there were enough people there who were interested so i think in my eyes that's kind of how i generally view it Started in SoCal, expanded out, uh, then you develop new regions as well as the online scene. So, my only thing is, I, there's just no way to confirm which side of the U.S. it started in. A hundred percent. Well, that that like, is yeah, true. That is true. That's my only thing. It's like everyone says the West Coast. I'm like, how do we know it didn't do this? <laughs> no, you you are correct. You are I correct. Know. Well, because I mean, the... I just, when you consider that a lot of the dance scene started on the East. You know, so like they kind of inspire each other. How do you know they didn't immediately put clothes on too well, when they became a bit? You know, it's just there's no, you are, you are correct. I'm, I'm basically just going off what is like the generally yeah. accepted answer, but but you are right. correct. Like, there's no historically well, speaking, like, there's not enough people documenting this stuff. So, well, we, well yeah. from um, from I, what I, I was gonna I, say, I, I've been kind of documenting the gloving history for a good while. I actually started at the very, like, my very first few episodes were actually, like, loving history points. Um, Mm -hmm. But as somebody who has been working on trying to document, like, where our origins technically start, I I feel, in a way, it's very much like a lot of other things that started. Like, I've seen people trace things back thousands and thousands of years when it comes to things like 
for example, furry art. People will trace it back to like ancient Egyptian times since they had the animal heads on top of the human bodies. Like they right, use right. that as a point of reference of like the earliest iterations of what can influence like modern day art type deal. So when it comes to right. gloving, uh, Jess even wrote it in his book about mudra, which is pretty much hand yoga from the subcontinent of India, uh, especially in the northern regions. So they have very different positions of hands and it's used for storytelling, it's used for traditional festival uh, performances, things of that nature, which is very aligned to Eastern philosophy, as I always refer to it as, uh, where they actually have a lot of things going on in their culture that they use music and dance to celebrate. Another point that people will point to as like the starting point for gloving would be like uh, Greg Irwin's finger ballet performance on Johnny Carson. Okay, and that was 86 or 87, I think is when he did that. Um, and of course, Amazing Lights and amongst a lot of members of the community point to Hermes' video in 2006 as like the starting point. Which technically, so, if you look at it in that sense, yes, because it went from just hands to hands and gloves to lights and gloves as the natural progression. So yeah, I, I would say the first, the, the starting point for gloving specifically, we would want to look at the first recorded time frame of like someone with lights on their fingers and then doing the thing. Like I, that that's where I would personally start in terms of like definition, like by definition, right? Like right, right. A and gloving light. Is Hermes video. Would you like, say that's, that's that the, the internet that discovered to. gloving in 2006? Then I the wouldn't. Internet. Yeah, I would say the internet discovered gloving, but I would not say society discovered gloving because it could have, like, like McKinley said, it could have been popped up beforehand, but it wasn't really recorded. That is or, true. It was, it was. It could have been recorded, but it wasn't made public. Right. My also. My, no. Go on. Go on. Oh, I was gonna say I was told uh, <laughs> stories, a couple stories of people who in California, when people were trying to record their show, people would go and like knock them up, like whoever was with them as their homies, like, "Hey, don't record." You know, I know that was a thing. Really? Why like, so? people didn't want their... to keep it secret. Keep the magic. Keep the whole thing secret. Nothing get out. You know. Gotcha. That's interesting. Okay. So it's very possible. Because you, because people could also say that the, well, like the or, the origins of gloving is interesting because it pulls from. We've already talked about this. I feel like like it pulls from so many different things, like just rave culture in general, mudra, finger styles, uh, glow sticking. Like it, it pulls from all of these things. But I would just say, for the sake of being like correct by definition. We would want to say that uh, the internet and the general public dis discovered gloving with the Hermes video. That that's what I would want to say. Right. Just for right. the sake to, uh, for the sake of having a starting point that we can actually fall back on. Right. So two things. Uh, the one argument about mudra I find compelling, but I don't know if I agree. Um, we we talked about this I think during our first session, where. We talked about the essence of gloving and one of the points that i originally brought up there was that similar ideas can just serendipitously show up in other places and time right i, I feel like the mudra influence is something that was more rediscovered like later but i feel like the more direct line like like the more direct line to influence for gloving would be glow sticking and uh, uh, liquid raving, right? Um, and that's just that's just my opinion, um, you know. But also, there's something to be said about subconscious influence, you know, like uh, generational memory, genetic memory, like being passed yeah. down, right? Which is also why, like, you know, kids in India, like, you know, their style is very distinct because, like, they have like a cultural difference uh in their surroundings that influences their style um my my second uh i guess talking point it's interesting that you mentioned like older generations of raving because you know i, I started going to shows somewhere around 2013 2014 right 
And, you know, by that point, rave culture was a lot more, like, open. Whereas if you think about the 80s and 90s, there were literally secret shows back then. You know, like, people, like, you had to literally get the right phone number uh, and call them in order to get access to those shows. And you only got them if you knew the right people. And that really changed around 2013 to 2014. Like, that really, that whole mentality really changed from being very secretive underground to more mainstream. Here's a party. Here are flyers. Wow. Right, right. Which is, you know, so there is a chance that because I've heard anecdotes of people saying, you know, gloving, you know, putting lights and gloves existed long before the early 2000s. But again, it, it makes sense what you said, McKinley, like we would not know about it because back then it was just such a secret. secret. Yeah, so it was such a secret. <clears throat> uh, and if, in fact, that's probably one of the first big differences in generations right because if we use 2006 as like the point where the internet discovered uh, discovered gloving we kind of use that as like a key point in our history that is a huge like distinction between the past and current generations yeah so you could say the first generation is one that we don't know much about because it's it was kept secret for so long right right yeah so i think i think it's fair to say that we can have at least those first two positions because because like we like we can agree that the difference between 2006 and 2011 gloving was probably drastically different too because that's five years of development oh absolutely alone. i would i would agree so i, I would say that <clears throat> watching f like old videos from like hermes and stuff like that Compared to like 2011, who was around then, Peter? Like, I think Fry was around his peak around that time, uh, right? He he started to come into promise in 2011. He didn't really hit his peak until about 2012 when he really exploded in terms of amazing lights. Um, but we had people like uh, Corduroy Mimic, uh, Anti Prestige, uh, Emac, Gummy, of course. Um, who who else? Uh, a lot of the TNT Munch. guys, Munch. Musk, Skittles, um, Teardrop, Wonton are th were like the Godfather OGs along with Hermes because they were like the first big wave of it. Uh, who, Homie on TNT at the Morpher. Uh, well, yeah, there's Musk. Yeah. And then Musk. Okay. Yeah. I was just gonna say awesome. Yogi is on there as well, and Yogi is known yeah, as a, one of the progenitors of morphing. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, it's. Go ahead. Interesting that you bring up that time, right? Because, you know, that's around the generation of stuff that where I first started, like, watching videos and stuff. Not to say I didn't have easier access to past videos because the time gap between 2005 to then versus 2005 to now was much smaller, you know? So I had easier access to, like, getting those videos off of YouTube and finding them easier. Um, but it's interesting to me because, like, you know, comparing those times, like, one thing... One difference that I see there uh, comes in twofold. You mentioned like anti and mimic, and that's around the time when you really start not tech, but like technique start to come about, right? And then the other real difference is I see from Glovers like Sharky and Gummy, and that they, in my eyes, are one of the original <laughs> Glovers that try to tell like explicit like narratives almost. You can see it in like the Gummy show. If you look at, um, that one show by Sharky, uh, I think it was Saving Grace, right? One of the first amazing, like... Like, like a product with his Starburst or like Sharky. Uh, said, I was going to say, right, I right. know I, in the last episode, when you mentioned that video, I put in the Starburst one because that was the first one I found of Sharky being his first Yeah, that was one first. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, that's kind of like the distinctions that I see because in the early days, a lot of it was still very primal. It was like in... Uh, extension of the rave scene so because of that you had a lot of like influence from like the uh, liquid rave scene and a lot of it was really just to match the music but you really start to see personality come out in that like next generation you know yeah and i would also say you definitely see the major influence of glow sticking uh involved right and not even like glow stringing part of it like the whole big movements that they were that was definitely invocative of glow stringing but then when it came to the smaller like finger rolls and things like that that was definitely a very um 
glow sticking maneuver that I right because remember people seeing, used because right. I remember seeing glow sticking being much more prevalent when I first started gloving, and I haven't really seen it around in a while. But then again, it's been it's been five years since I've been to a festival, <laughs> so I, feel I, like I don't even know. I feel like in terms of modern rave culture, glow sticking has kind of been swallowed up by like the glow poi stringing community. at least, right? Like by the poi community because it's like a variation off that. Um, it has a different form factor, so you can do different things with it. You there's know, two different kinds of glow sticking too. Like there's the freehand, and then there's the glow stringing. Well, and yeah, that yeah exactly. The main thing to compare it to, it's similar to gloving in the sense that everything got put in a little clubhouse, but then no more resources were made for the public. You know, right, right. I, I've recently tried to find glow string tutorials and glow sticking. The only ones that are available are the ones from 2010. <laughs> Dang, there's no, there's no, there's no, like, there are people have been posting now recently again, all only on Facebook. Pros and cons of this is that it keeps it magical, but no one's really doing it. That's what, but let that, that's the pros and cons of all that. If you sell out and give everyone the magic, what's keeping it magical? I was just going to say, um, you have the magic of, uh, I don't want to say animosity, but the, the lack of comprehension of what's happening, but then yeah. you have the bottleneck as I like to refer to it, where you literally are stifling the growth and potential of expansion of the art style by trying to keep it secret. Or as it's been told to me, trying to quote unquote, protect it you mean yeah, it might not even be that it might just like the, the tutorials that are there are effective mm -hmm. but they're just dated very no, very dated it's true i mean you know? my my overall stance on that to be honest is i think it's good to be open because even if something becomes more aware there's still a mystique around certain things like to people who don't know it you know it's still yeah, exactly. out of seven billion people <laughs> You know? Yeah, right, right. I, I, it's like... That's the thing I was also going to point out as well is the scaling effect. Like, you, you had to point this out to me, McKinley, because there was like a video I found that, uh, from Lorne that was like 70 million views on it. I'm like, how the f did I miss this? And you're just like, Peter, there's there's 7 billion people in the world. He's like, that's still, <laughs> that's still a small number in the grand scheme of things. And that kind of actually, like, I don't, the lack of a better <laughs> yeah. phrase. It humbled me a bit because it made me realize right. like 40 million views is a lot, but 7 billion people. I mean, there's like what, 16 it's billion fraction. views on the very first video of YouTube, mm -hmm. I think. So it's like, yeah. you just really, it puts in the scale how, how, what fame is, right? When you get your household name really, really big to where everyone knows it, that's a whole different thing, you know? Yeah, and that's why everyone's really paying for attention. That's like that's the main thing that it right. all is. Even like with gloving itself is about messing with your attention. You know, how yeah. to maintain it. Yeah, I would right, say, right. I, I would say that the whole uh, keeping things like low key and keeping things more secretive to maintain that magic, in my opinion, is definitely like more of an old head mentality. Like it's it's prominently like an old head gatekeeping mentality, and like like McKinley said, there there are pros and cons to it, but there there does become a point where the information just kind of seeps out anyway. It, it depended on how the hobby decides to cultivate itself. Right. Well, it's like um, people, people also, don't even I know their like... secrets. They're just like, what is it? They don't even yeah. know that it's gloving. They need to know right. that part first. <laughs> I honestly think people underestimate the power of the word of mouth. You know, yes, mm -hmm. it travels extremely slower compared to the internet where everything's just so instantaneous, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you tell 10 people and then those 10 people tell another 10 people and then each of those people tell another 10 people, that's like a thousand people that already heard about this one thing. And that's through uh, one, two, three iterations. Yeah, that's how loving became a pyramid scheme. Oh, dude, are your feet on the ground? <laughs> but yeah, uh, for <laughs> in terms of <laughs> generations, right? Like, I feel like a place that we can. St so we already started and talked about kind of like identifying factors of like this current generation or the 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 generation where I would say you guys all started, right? Like 2010 to 2013 period is like where you guys started gloving, I would say. 
right? We've already kind of identified some of that. Mm -hmm. And that is what people today would refer to as old gen, right? Like the OGs, when you have, you know, 10-ish years under your belt, you're, you're generally considered an OG. So then what well people I don't know constitute 28 or prior as OG 20 uh, 2009 to like 2011 is old head which is where I kind of fall into that camp okay and then you have old school which is your 2012 to 20 like 15 era okay so then you have old school okay yeah then it goes to new school which is your 2016 to 2017 ish maybe 2018. And then you have new gen, which is 2019 to now. Okay. I was going to say, I heard people were referred to as new gen, even if they had five years up to this date of fucking February 11th, 2022. Like if you had five years, you were still considered like new gen. I think the, new gen the, the unspoken <laughs> consensus right. of the separation between old gen and new gen is 2016 where IGC stopped. Mm -hmm. That was the last IGC we got. So that kind of era of that's, loving that's actually fell fair. away. And that's well, where a lot of people will discern it. Well, would you say that there is, but there, the thing is you can see a generation, a generational difference that came through COVID too. I, would, sure. like, I would definitely say 2020 the, to now, that is a new, like that is another generation set. Like that definitely is a new, school thought right there for you because that's the generation that i came in the the covid gen covid gen yeah because that's the generation i came in like Zoom uh, it, in in 10 days it would have been three years since i got my first light show but then it wasn't until a year and some change after that that i started pick up gloving well th let me ask you as someone who like started in that like kind of newer generation what do you think kind of defines you guys who start around that time and how does it compare to like older generations from your opinion? Well, like from from what I've observed with the people that that kind of picked it all up at the same time as me, like a, a, a really great example that I can use because uh, it would be my brother, because when me and him both got our first light shows, right? It would don't need to go into details of everything <laughs> but but basically we got the light shows it was crazy it was it was a pretty life-changing experience at the time uh in the morning cody went and bought his first set of gloves i'm pretty sure they were controls he he immediately bought a set of gloves right or no it wasn't controls maybe it was but he he bought it the next day regardless and you know during this whole time period i'm just sitting back watching Right. I'm, I'm just kind of just I'm not really practicing anything. And the one thing that I noticed from him and, you know, this he he might not serve as like the best example because one person is not a good example. It, right. it, 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 it might not necessarily fit everybody else. It is anecdotal, though. So, yeah, but he was very focused on like the technique of things like one of the first things he wanted to learn how to do was wave tide, right? He wanted to develop his his technical movements. And like McKinley McKinley was there for his growth, honestly. Like cuz I think Cody hopped into WWG when he was like 4 months in. I taught him his doors. Yeah. I gave him his hallway to play with. Yeah. He like Cody My Cody's Padawan. Yeah, his general focus has always been um technique and it's really interesting because i would say that my general focus when i finally picked it up was not technique it was the flow of it mm -hmm. which, which is which in itself is not a generational difference it's more so like a preference difference and i think cody serves as in my opinion he serves as a pretty good example as to what this covid generation that i'm in wants to focus on like clusters uh their their tech you know all of these things and then they come back to their flow later they want to come yeah. back to, like solidify on their flow later and i think mckinley could agree because he sees people like that come in all the time 
Basically, it's like they get so focused and hung up on a certain move, and they end up learning it one side. And they're like, man, I keep getting in this loop, but it's because they have to let go of it. But right, they're just so hooked on it, they're not letting go. It's not until they take that break finally, that and they exactly, come back and not repeat themselves. That is exactly what <laughs> I was going to point out, because I got... I got a handful of people into into gloving. Like throughout my years of gloving, I got other people into it, and I can even point out like what drew them into it, uh, especially from my shows. Like especially when I was teaching somebody from like 2012 to 2014, maybe 2015 at the full extension. Um, depth perception was the whole thing. People love seeing moves that did depth perception. So this was one that I got my friend Ashley into gloving because I did this to her. Oh and man, Josh does totally that one really that. good. Josh does that one good. She fell absolutely in love with that. Um, a lot of people that I got in that from like when I first started, finger rolls, whips, and um, tunnels were the whole rage. Like everybody wanted to do that because everybody just wanted to see the big trails happening multiple times. I would certainly say anyone who was getting in like 2016, to 2018 2019 was definitely wave tuts digits dials you know a lot more technical based stuff like because to me i think what people don't realize is that the meta was shaping people's entry points like what they first got into was whatever the hot whatever was the hottest thing on everybody's minds that's where we're seeing it now like clusters is always the first thing I hear from new people. Like, I want to learn clusters. I want to do clusters. And it's just because... And clusters that's didn't really start right taking now. off until 2016, 2017, right? Exactly. Like, the... the Because clusters are just dials. But... <clears throat> but we'll... And we'll, we'll get to that conversation at a different point. But it's like... Okay. Clusters so, are just dials with better... With different isolations. I've always but also like clusters I was a combination... I always consider it as a combination a of strategy. digits, dials, and pinches, and pokes. Like th those four is what makes clusters. I'm gonna get into I, this right now because you yeah, seem like you have a lot to say. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah, yeah lay it I, on I us. Like, lay it on us. All right, so clusters are not necessarily like they can be made of any of those things you just listed. Mm -hmm. A cluster is just the structure, and then maintaining an idea. So you're all right, you have all these points that are all points, but it doesn't necessarily have to like pinch. It's just like ideas, you know, because these right. this is kind of right. like a pinch, but they're dials all at once. I, I it's think just I a structure and an idea that you're just trying to just maintain. <laughs> Not necessarily those little movements. Those are just a way to do find what you're doing I, I think what i was describing just maintaining was ideas what the concept is which is clusters and then what mechanics people have used to create the concept dial right digits, yeah it's pinches pokes you know right because those are the mechanics right because i've talked about this with dustin before that i think that the technical definition of clusters is very different from what people aesthetically think of as clusters right because a lot of people consider clusters to be like you know dials with isolation points and negative space but honestly you can even do something like this and because of the way that position you... and that's what you do with the points and maintain the idea right, the right. You start doing this stuff it's not a cluster but if you maintain that stuff you know or something like that like where it's like all oh, right here's six mm. points to, to, to see what i'm saying yeah exactly that's because of anything thing i'm doing so clusters <laughs> are a sandwich then that's what I'm getting from this. Clusters are sandwiches. Little and little all the mechanics that go into it are the ingredients. It basically is how I would describe it. Is like all right, well, you heard it is the sauce. You heard it here, folks. Clusters are sandwiches. I will certainly say I applied how I go about taking an entire archetype and breaking it down to the concepts, then breaking it down to the techniques and mechanics that make up the concepts to make up the archetype. For example, morphing, platforming, impacting, conjuring. I'm strongly considered doing teleporting next, um, just because that's such a different, off the chart thing when it comes to uh, archetypes in itself. Uh, but we'll that, talk about archetypes a different time. Yeah, yeah that, actually, that's I, I kind of, 
I kind of do want to that bring, topic. Yeah, I kind of want to actually bring us back like a step. You know, we were talking about mm -hmm. like the generation with like whips and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? Uh, we 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 kind of talked about how we kind of consider that still like the flow days. But if we look at the macro of like the gloving timeline, you know, going from like flow to more like technical understanding, we can even see that with whips because like if you think about it, whips really came from like finger rolls and different ways to do finger rolls, and like that's how you got like the circle move eventually. And when people started thinking about the technique of finger rolls and really diving into that rabbit hole, that's how you got different whip and uh whip wrap sequences how you eventually got flails it's just interesting to see that macro kind of timeline being like possibly in reference to something a little bit more micro in terms of like certain aspects of gloving culture in this case whips you know but yeah, yeah it's definitely. it's interesting to see well it's like i guess it is easy to um kind of put a specific concept or a specific like idea to a specific generation to each generation right like i'm sure if i asked you guys like what was like the big thing in 2013 you guys would more than likely agree on one thing i don't know about that but fair enough fair well, enough. like what, what is something that was like the most popular like what, what was something that was like the most like worked on or the most Honestly, on the immediate for me, it would be some like flow tech. And in terms of 2013? Yeah, 2012 yeah. 20, 20, 20, to 2014. I would definitely say people were definitely learning how to get tutting and finger tutting, king tutting, all that stuff to mesh together in a flow state. So it's kind of basically what Josh said with flow tech is because I will certainly say tuts were very huge in 2012. And people were definitely starting to learn how to incorporate king tutting a lot more. Like that became very prevalent um, compared to finger tuts. Uh, once digits and dials really started taking uh, a huge advancement in expansion, that's when finger tutting really, really took hold even further. But I think when that would was just how they uh, I'd say that was. I'd say 2014 too. I would definitely say 2014 was the okay. big turning point on that. Because I, I, like I said, I think it's easy to talk about uh, generations of glovers or rather you can you can mark generations based on like which techniques start becoming more and more incorporated mm -hmm. i Definitely. would say also you can like kind of tie those techniques to who was prominent at the time because by 2014 i would say that a lot of the stuff that people like loki and rockstar were pioneering people were finally like really gravitating towards the stuff mm -hmm. that they were working on like tech concepts dials tuts um because around that point you know flow tut oh uh, flow tech was a really prominent style but that's also when you start to see tech really starting to overcome uh what was general like flow you know so i would even say like you know we're saying flow tech now because that's how we define it but back then i wouldn't have said flow tech i don't I agree there were definitely people said. using that term back then or i'm time for me Okay. I didn't hear that term until way later. Uh, I would have been calling it finger tutting. I would have said not necessarily liquid, but it was kind of like just the way they were using stacks back then were way different than how we do them now. And not necessarily impacting, but thumb reveals because <laughs> they would do impacts or they would just do the, the hyper stroke thumb. But all the whole show is focused on here. You well, know. I was just going to point out, if, me. if you watch Impact and shows from 2010 compared to like Fry in 2012 to 2014, you definitely see a more technical application on the style, which is very true to how gloving shifted during that time. It was, yes, things got more technical, and yeah, we did lose the whole flow, constantly keep going, don't think about what you're doing, just keep going uh, mentality, and people actually really starting to break it down in that more technical sense, which totally makes sense. You see it impacting, you saw it in morphing, you actually saw more concepts come out that brought about new styles via platforming. Um, you know, grid theory actually became much more publicly conscious in the public mind, in the public sphere. Uh, so wh when you look at how gloving culture has really evolved, it's definitely just what was happening around that time because if you even look at pre-2010 look at what youtube looked like youtube was not that good of a platform 
prior to 27, uh, 2007. Like, it was a really, the, really bad platform. The Dark Ages. Yes, the Extreme Dark Ages before the random purge that redefined how YouTube was going to be uh, shaping. You know, and I feel like YouTube had a huge hand in how gloving really flourished in the early days. Because so, so what? So I guess because we're on the early days still, I want to talk about um, because, like I said, because I wasn't really part of it. I, I I am more so curious about it myself. Like, how was? competitive gloving then like when 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 were the first like competitions going on right like and and there was a nine and and and, okay so like you have competitions from that point and then the last igc was when 2016 2016 there were some bosses here and there after that but like i know with uh lights on was also like the thing that kind of like took the placeholder position so that's but that's different i think we and that's that's something that we'll get to later like gloving in real life and gloving online is very different um Mm -hmm. so i guess i want to start with like was the gloving meta back then more dictated based on what kind of movements you threw because of how they looked in person was it, yeah, was I mean, it they different? were they were all like online. Com- uh, they were all. I'm sorry. They were all like competitions in real life. I, I remember when I first started and I saw that there were gloving competitions. You know, matches being posted on YouTube. At least for me, living on the East Coast was it almost had like a like a like a mythical or like a mysterious vibe because it was like something that for me was far out of reach. You know, but I would say definitely back then people were posting online right but there's there weren't a whole lot of gloving competitions online you know right yeah no so it was definitely more dictated towards how you did it in person like i'm thinking of of some of the earliest matches i can think of the one uh <clears throat> where i think boo right boo was a prominent competitor back then so was sharky um but yeah like it was a lot of it was more dictated towards how people threw in person which and it's not like we could really judge it was like oh, okay this is what they thought they thought one sometimes yeah. you agree sometimes you, so you didn't. from my experience you just enjoyed the change yeah before, yeah because there's more of a dance battle before it was I, just yeah, I was gonna say battle. if you know how rap battles were or how they were back then or they the kind of are like now but like think eight mile how like the rap battle was done in that movie right that's how yeah. the first gloving competitions were kind of held. Like that's that's how. It was yeah, held. just very much like defending your turf type of thing. Very much, and it's very invocative of just how hip hop dance culture was in the early days as well. Is you had these dance battles where it was just two people going up against each other, and the crowd had the whole you know uh, who got the biggest crowd uh, sound from. Right. So so I guess it would depend on like who had the more impactful punchlines right who who had the better just like the better big moves i guess who who was more showy yep i guess but then like so even so even though like the generations definitely started shifting and and evolving from 2008 up until i will use the point of 2016 as the last igc right you can say that the gloving culture was evolving, but would you say that they were still doing, I guess for a, a better broad term, like very impactful moves? Like they were focused on like oh, yeah. like big punchline impactful moves still? Because- yeah. Getting right on the drop and stuff like that, almost definitely. Right, because you could say now like with online competitions, obviously it's still like a crowd pleaser to have good punchlines but you're but because of how like scoring is now as well it's it's um it's heavily dictated by the rest of the substance in your show it's it's more so dictated by like all of the things that lead up to your punchline and if you hit your punchline when before i i'm again i'm not sure but it seems like it wasn't as in like important like not saying not to say that it wasn't important but it held way less weight as compared to now it's just like 
before it's like you could they were just go and whatever you dropped you couldn't take back you know we're here you can rewind you know you can go back i can see every move you did right back then you really couldn't do that and right. not only that so i've heard things from competitions over there because <clears throat> yes yeah, it started off as more of a crowd thing but then once they started getting judges it didn't it, 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 it sometimes it was more of a oh well here's who's running the comp you know and that was a real thing just like in hip-hop where you know maybe right. the crowd just doesn't like you despite your skill so they are all like yo other guy won and that's how it is that's the streets. Right. <laughs> and, and, I mean, that's still uh, kind of still kind of a thing, a little bit. But not I was 100%. just gonna say, it's, there's, there's remnants there's, of that mentality, not as a bad yeah. thing, but there's still remnants of that mentality that still lives on today in the government culture that we see in pit battles. Yeah, but, but I feel but, like that has to be backed up a little bit more but now I, than I, before right. because People you can do have rewind, to like you like said. Yeah. yeah, people do explain themselves. They are actually able to pinpoint on your videos in terms of pit battles and stuff like that. Um, I can't really speak about the live pit battles that uh, Michael's throwing uh, regionally. Like, I think the Arizona one just either started or just finished up. I think they just finished, finished up. Yeah, yeah. They, they just finished it. <coughs> At the time of I this believe recording, of Master course. Hand won. Master Hand beat Jest. I watched oh, yeah. the back end of his stream and his his quote was he lost uh two to one because the tiebreaker judge the the final decision was his intro wasn't liked like he didn't like his intro so that's why he lost and i was like i don't know how this shit works i don't know how no. it works well it's so interesting to me that we're kind of going back to because you know We've thrown, like, here in the DMV, we've thrown boss competitions, right? Mm -hmm. But even then, you know, online competitions were really the more prominent medium because of just how accessible it is. But it's interesting to me that <coughs> Battles is starting to make its way around uh, in person. Um, I'm really curious to see how it works in person um, because I know that Michael Horvath is trying to get one out in the East Coast. And yeah, I, I think that if anything, going back to pit battles, I know we're kind of jumping timelines here, but I really like the way that it's currently set up where you have two to three judges with the crowd that's a tiebreaker because I've seen and judged matches where the judges will agree on one thing, but we're also looking for trying to be as unbiased as possible. We're looking at the overall package usually, right? Even if we do say, even if people know that certain judges will look out more for other things, but you know, their job is to look at the whole package as much as possible. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see how often the crowd will have a completely different op opinion, right? Like for example, I remember this one match that I judged with, uh, Dustin, who was it? It was, um, just a night shift, right? They went against each other. Yeah. Yeah, so I judged that one, and I believe that Jest won. He won. I, 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 I was the judge for that with Scott, and we both agreed that Jest had the better show. I liked the show more, but you know, both shows were great. But it was just so interesting to see how the crowd reacted. You know, and I thought that was just so interesting. Well, I, mean, I think that's a that's a different situation because you have to also consider uh, persona and publics. Uh, the public's uh, take on that person's persona, right? Like, I mean, I, like, I'll just say it because it doesn't matter to me. But like, you know, you have a person like Josh, and I know Josh doesn't uh, just, he doesn't intentionally attempt to get people on PM to vote for him, right? But his connections will vote for him because it's a connection, right? And, and that's kind of the same, the same sense as like, uh, if you have two people that are like battle rapping, right? They the 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 challenger, yeah, right, man. yeah, the challenger could be from out of town, and the person that's been winning all the time is is the local that the that everyone likes. So they could just vote for the local just for the sake of staying at home, you know? Keeping the yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. 
like I've, I've experienced that myself where um, we had a DMV comp and I went up against Lust in the final match. And I'm not saying that the judges w were being uh, consciously biased or anything like that. But there is something to be said about being on your home turf. But that's why I find it so interesting, right? Because the dynamics change because people, you know, you know, we have scorecards now that were developed specifically because, you know, we we're trying to find an, obje an objective metric for the quality of your show but as much as it tr tries to do that I, I think in my experience both as a judge and as a competitor and that oftentimes as much as we can try especially since this is an art like this is a battle of art mm -hmm. right it is not a game specifically it's an art that there are outside factors there's something to be said about charisma and influence that you bring into your shows into your match and also your judge's preference too right exactly exactly yeah like a, a judge could be more aligned with like how you do your flow and then they could get bored with tech mm -hmm. so then if someone throws a tech heavy show they're like oh whatever right right I, I remember going to uh nyc a couple months later uh, and i went solely to do like uh media right i was just like recording the matches for them and i talked to both lust and uh folly uh, on two separate occasions at that event and i know that lust explicitly said you know when i judge a lot of times just inherently i'm looking for the technique i'm looking like for how well you how well and how clean your technique is whereas folly um says i do focus on those things to an extent but i'm a lot more about the presentation like how powerful was that show mm -hmm. how dynamic was that show uh, it's interesting because you know I i'll say it here you know i, I tell people all the time as a judge, I do my very best to be unbiased. You know, I'll give my reasons and hopefully they'll be well thought out. But you can't really get rid of bias 100%. Like you do, you inherently have your preferences as a judge and that's what it is. I feel like you can lower it. Oh, you, you thing, most definitely can. Yeah, like with all those scorecard situations, there's still something to be said that it's still, you're trying to add an objective, but the objective's still not clear. You know, when you add like a specific challenge or a theme to something, you have a more clear objective and the bias lowers because that is very clear. But when you're just, OK, I'm scoring on the objective is my objective. You know, it's it's not as clear. Yeah, like it's there, that there, scorecard, but it's kind of your scale. But yeah. if you add you take away and add in a clear objective or a challenge to that. It lowers it, I feel. Right. I think that's something that could be experimented on. Having introducing competitions that have, you know, they, they kind of still do it, but they don't really openly say it's a musicality challenge. They start off with like trance and they start changing the genres every round, right? But that's right. something that if they're openly more open about that, it, I feel like that clears it up more, but they're not. You know? So I guess I'm doing something like right that. then, huh, McKinley? I, yeah, I would say you are. I mean, I've even found that. Even how clear as I thought I was trying to be when it came to like the trial. Trying to that too. For example, uh, people still had to hit me up and to clarify some things, and I was just like, "Damn, I I really thought I was being as clear as possible." Because to me, it was I want to see what you know about your personal style, and then take your personal style and be like, "Okay, how can I break it down to know what my foundations are? Like, what does?" my foundations make up my style, which was the first challenge. Uh, and people had to come and ask me exactly what I was looking for. I was like, all I'm looking for is a show of nothing but foundations, but these are the foundations you are telling me this makes up your style. If you want to learn how to do my style, you need to have these foundations in place. And well, so, yeah, go on. Peter, uh, Peter, I would say eh, eh, not, not the issue, right? But like, I guess for lack of a better term, the, the issue is that the the way that your trials are is that i think that you are laying out what you're looking for very clearly but the issue comes that it's very vague as to what the person is right because it's like like you could you could ask me what my foundations are and i could very easily tell you that my main foundations are finger rolls and liquid right like i, I could very easily just tell you that but then there are some people that don't understand what their foundations are because of how they learn. So I, like I said, I don't think the way that you have it set is incorrect. 
I think it's just more so pe the the people that are showing interest don't understand as well as you would have expected them to. Yeah. And I'm not uh, that's, that's that's what I think more of is. Well, to me it's just like this is where I feel as a community this is where we start to try to find that standard where we all are on the same page in terms of, you know, what where's, we are saying. Where's uh Josh, you got sent fucking Seaways uh the thing he was working on, right? The the glossary or whatever. His yeah, little. It's like you a, shared it's it like in a, here. Yeah, he he has he has. It's it's just tough to find to like have everyone agree on one accepted thing. Like I think it's great that Seaway did that. It's I think it's just difficult to have everyone agree on one thing. Yeah, it's true. I mean, for a long time, you know, people were having uh, discussions about what was storytelling, right? I think we even touched upon that a while ago. Uh, like, what I is storytelling? Where some people look at it in terms of structure and, and other people think of it more from a narrative sense, you know? When it's both. I would it's definitely both. say right. during the, the After Hours special, uh, right, yeah, last right. episode. Uh, you can you can link the After Hours somewhere. Up, yeah, where Peter will direct you. Yeah, right here. People touch Peter, right here. Peter number this, one. Yeah, watch right watch that video. Peter Prime. Peter um, Prime. Go, Alpha go, Peter. Go subscribe to the WWG YouTube channel. Come on. Okay, so with that discussion, um, I'm going to bring us back a little bit um, because we've been talking about like how different competition structures have kind of been different throughout the generations right yeah and i feel like in a lot of ways it has fed into like the overall zeitgeist mm -hmm. of like loving history at that time like we have the introduction of scorecards right and that really like kind of helps solidify like what is the general accepted foundations of what people are looking for um and it, it has had a huge influence on what is considered a winning show like i remember a couple of years ago I, it was either a boss or an igc where the final match was against ice cream teddy and um what's the machine right i can't remember if it was a boss or an igc but a lot i remember a lot of people in the comments were saying you know machine should have taken that machine should have taken that and oh, i'm saying yeah, well yeah, yeah. right right and i'm like well hold on you have to remember that no matter what competition you're in whether it's clubbing or not you have to consider that if you are choosing to participate as a competitor, you are beholden to the laws and the rules of said competition. And this was a scorecard based competition. And of course, Ice Cream Teddy was going to win because he understands the nature of scorecards. You know, like, yeah, he understands how to navigate uh, it, navigate it, play with the numbers and how to have a balanced show. Whereas opposed to what I find interesting as to now, we're getting a lot of specialized competitions, right? That are asking for very specific things. And that is also changing the dynamic of not only the way we compete, but the way people flow, which I think is interesting. They're asking for more. We have our foundations as a community. Now everyone, find ways to use that foundation to express yourself. <clears throat> Something to bear in mind. He did make those scorecards. Yeah, that's a whole other discussion. I don't want to get that's into that. That's, that's, yeah. that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm not going to go too deep. I'm just going to throw that out there. See, think that what yeah. you will. And something else to consider. GFC, they developed those. Mm -hmm. Which was also very controversial. So right, right. That, now you got a discussion for another day on scorecards. And yeah, that's a whole that other discussion. I, I was just going to say, yeah. like, right, that I was down, like, you were pointing out facts of the down. case, and that's something that I does need you. to be addressed. Like, there are well, certain facts that are true. Like, he did have his hand in developing so, the scorecards not only for IGO but for GSC so take that as you will audience battle, members I've literally had this conversation with Adam and Jay you can see a battle on video where the audience thinks something entirely different from if you were actually there yeah the energy can be completely different oh yeah and um I, I so like so many to factors. stay to stay on topic with um yeah. what we're with where we're at, I would say at least from my perspective, I guess the introduction of like a scorecard is kind of what helped prompt people to be more focused on technique, right? Because, you know, one of the 
one of the categories on the scorecard that is widely used is complexity. And from my understanding, there isn't so much that people will look at in terms of complexity when it comes to like flow technique, right? Because me and Josh were talking about this yesterday, I think, where like uh, if, if we were to try and describe how I glove, I'm definitely more flow based with tech with like more technical movements thrown out in into it. Mm -hmm. But I think also I could also make the argument that I can throw very technical movements within my liquid. Right? Because you can yeah, have yeah. a very technical liquid, but then you're, the the general person will not see it and be like, oh, that's really complex. Something I want to point out that I know we didn't touch on, but it it needs to be remarked that when we talk about the shifts in gloving, especially in the culture, especially during like 2012 to 2014, where things got more technical, it needs to be remarked that liquid also evolved exponentially with digital liquid application and digital understanding of finger independence. So as much as, yes, digits and dials took off and... Uh, finger tutting took off really prominently. Wave tutting also evolved by the application of digital liquid. And uh, I don't want that to be missed. Like that's something that glovers who are coming into this hobby now really need to understand of how gloving really evolved. And it kind of shocks me. Well, actually no, it's not as much as shocks, but it's it made me realize how important it is that I'm doing the, the gloving history series because I even got a comment that's like, wow, I wasn't there for the first eight years of gloving. And it's insane to see how things change so drastically in a short period of time, just from its inception type deal. And didn't realize that people didn't, people just don't know. And it scares me that people are not talking about it <laughs> in a way. Because there, there's, there's a lot of things that people need to understand that when it comes to gloving culture is how it really evolved, especially during these time periods. Because that well, first renaissance also, was a huge game changer, no matter what people say. Well, you have to keep in mind that I think for a lot of newer people, like, for example, like, for people who've been in it for a long time, like, the things that we immediately take in from the stuff at the time, that's going to stick with us, you know? But at the same time, like, as much as I agree with you that it is important to understand, like, the history of how things evolve because there's a lot of influences that you can take from looking at the past, right? There's also something to be said that you can't really fault people who are just coming in from not knowing that stuff because, for example, when Dustin was over, I tried to show him a couple of videos from the past and his response was, oh, this is cool, it's okay. And I'm like, at first I was like taken aback, but then I'm like, oh, well, of course he feels that way because we've evolved so far and the stuff that he's going to put into his RAM is going to be stuff that pertains to the current zeitgeist you know and as much as it makes me sad that people aren't thinking about stunna on the immediate and like people like that it makes sense it makes sense like you only have so much room in your brain and you want to make sure it's the stuff that is going to pertain to you you know right it's also how you pitch it and make it valuable to the person that's true like for example like there are some videos that i wish i'd shown them but like for example like I feel like Dustin would appreciate, like, for example, like, LA Logic, if you remember who that is. You could, Peter, you you could have, Logic? You, but then you could have put it on display. I like, guess the way you present it to somebody. You yeah, know, that is fair. I'm a bad salesman, so... so, so here, here, the way you do all that, and they're like, okay, I'm really paying attention now. And like, you know? Then, then here's my personal challenge, then. Um, so I mentioned this in earlier episodes, and I already did, like, my part. Right, and I know I told Dustin that like one night I was actually working on it while I was sitting on here in Discord. Uh, the three by three idea, so the nine videos that inf that shows your personal gloving style or influence by these people or by these styles that they create. Um, my personal challenge to you is you guys figure out where your th three by three because I already have mine. And you know so, what? so, I'm, so I'm for the challenge. So for the uh, viewers, right, because they could participate in this too as well, would you put a chart up or describe the 3x3? Three three? Also, I forgot what it is. Okay, so for the people who don't know, a 3x3 three three is something that a lot of creators do in terms of the art community. Um, it's like 
these artists or the way that they influence me or these art styles that you see throughout history or these are the ones that you can look at and be like yeah i see that in your style i see that in your personal take on whatever hobby or the case may be people do it for like they're three by three for anime they're three by three for manga i've seen people do it for uh digital artists uh movies various things or in this case these are like if you want to have a visual representation of what your style is a culmination of these nine videos are like the ones that you go these are the ones that influence my show these are the one like these styles or these techniques or whatever the case may be you will see in my show so what what is the three by three uh referring to then what is the three what three what and so, three what so the way that people have gone about it is like the top three or like the foundations like these are the quintessential videos that literally make up my style or these are the three mm -hmm. animes or three mangas that really put my taste into play like this is what cultivated my personal taste within whatever you know within their own drawings or uh whatever hobby they're into so in this case for like for me i have the top three or these are the ones that literally set my style the way it is if it wasn't for these three people or three videos that really represent the influence, in my opinion, uh, my style wouldn't be what it is today. Uh, okay, the middle so, three are yeah. kind of like your personal taste of what you like to see in a show. And I have that set for me as well. And the bottom three are things that you don't have in your style, but are working towards getting into your style. So it's like more newer gen stuff. Like it goes from like, these are the first ones that started my style. These are what really helped solidify it. And these are the things that I want to try to incorporate. You know, these okay. are the things I'm working towards. So it shows where you started, what you're currently on and what you're working towards. I like that. I, I'm, I'm going to try to have mine before the next episode. I, I could definitely, I will definitely, I could definitely have the whole, out. I'm going to try the whole graphic thing, get this chart to show up. It's going to be kind of crazy. Some people look at it like, oh, I do it as like my alignment of like what personality I would have in these categories of like lawful good, chaotic, chaotic, neutral. chaotic yeah, all that stuff. I've seen people yeah, go I'm that the... route. I've seen people just, it's however you want to take it, but that's how I set up my three by three is my foundations, my current state, my uh future goals kind of deal okay okay well yeah. i would say that one of my videos if you could find one of them in terms of personal preference and tastes is definitely the one video of recursion throwing a tut sequence he found but in the middle of the tut sequence he hits his vape with his nostril is that on facebook or is that on yeah it's on it's on facebook it's it's funny Oh, I'm going to have to go digging. <laughs> Maybe I'll just hit him up and just like, hey, do you have this post safe somewhere? Like, oh, do you, I mean, I could video? probably find it, but I can't tag you in it. No tag me. Oh, yeah, because you're, you're, you're fucking banned yeah. right now, right? Yeah, I'm banned for 28 more days. <laughs> Rest in peace. Okay. It's okay. So, I have, a, I have a question. Yes. For you guys. So, we talked about how overall, like, history, as well as competition history, has influenced, like, the different generations, right? I want to do a slight segue, if that's okay with people. Go ahead. How do people feel about the advancements in technology influencing generations? Oh, dude. Uh, so, like, for for me, right, I, it's like, the advancements that I took with all of the technology that I use in gloving in the two years that I have been doing it, right, going on two years in uh, March, it'll be two years that I've been doing this seriously. You know, I started with this fish, fish eye on this phone with a broken camera right it's now broken i did that first from march right uh the end of march up until october october was when i got my first gopro and it was a gopro 5 
and then m maybe like another six months passed and i got a gopro 8 right so that alone was a huge like a huge jump for myself because the way my shows would look the amount of confidence that it gave me because my shows looked better on camera and it allowed for my drive to keep on going that alone right for me was just a huge advancement and then once i started looking at the different lights like my first set was just ions that i had forever and i got my first set of bulbs that kind of changed the game for me because the and this is all stuff that was already available for me i couldn't imagine the kind of impact that all of these things had when they started coming out and started being used right like now now that i've already kind of and it's weird because i used ions first but then i went back to a more primitive form of gloving which was with bulbs and something about it was just a lot better for me and then now i'm using controls a lot and there there is something to be said about like even in just camera quality and the technology that you have with their camera alone because if if i do uh a quick look at the first gopro right the first gopro when was the gopro invented the very first gopro came out in 2002. wow right they were probably expensive as shit at the time and people probably weren't using them at the time people were probably more so using like camcorders if anything yeah like my first camera that i used to record frequently was a flip hd if you guys remember what those are They're like these little blocks like about yay big and like mm. yeah, it was like super simple you just like press the button in the middle and it recorded it had a little screen about that big but you know it wasn't for example like a wide angle you know it was like probably like a medium a standard like view ones. type yeah of... exactly so i know it definitely influenced the way i threw because i had to like be very particular about my framing and what kind of moves i threw there wait wait a second there's no way this is the first gopro gp hero what i i mean i th it's i think it's funny when i actually go and look at some of my old old videos that i had that just not released and i mean <laughs> I look at it now, it's just like, oh my god. You can definitely tell I was just a hand waver for a good while. I mean, weren't we all? I mean, I yeah. think it's <laughs> I think it's interesting, uh, like, you know, you see certain types of stuff getting popular as they release. You know, we had bulb and chip, we had programmables, and within programmables we had certain advancements such as um new strobe patterns, uh tint <clears throat> control accelerometers uh and you know we've been in the stagnation for a while with gloving technology um which had a lot of people going back to ball the chip and now we have new technology coming out in the form in the form of the vortex and i'm very curious to see how it's going going to influence like newer styles so i want to take a second to look at this because it is interesting because i found a timeline right so 2004 was the first gopro was the okay. very first gopro 2004 wow and we that... <laughs> we we would say that gloving started coming about in what we'll, we'll say 2006 2008 yeah. well if we use, right? if we use hermes video on youtube it, yeah if we use like hermes April video six is when okay. we can say like that's the first point right so I'm pr I'm almost positive that that show wasn't recorded with a GoPro. No, probably not. Um, but I think we can use this timeline as as kind of like a thing to show when GoPros slash like wide angle slash super view camera lenses were being used more so often. So 2004 was the first GoPro. Right, and they also made a 35 millimeter version. It looks really horrendous, in my opinion. Ugh. Um, but then the f next GoPro two, the GoPro two didn't come out for another oh eight my. years. Eight years. Eight years, dude. That's wow, in eight years. Okay. That, that's crazy. 
Now, uh, a, f- a friend of mine, I, you guys know Elijah. Mm-hmm. Um, he uses a GoPro 4, I believe, black. He uses that. I that. really realize how old they are. Right, me too. Yeah. The GoPro 4, which came out two, three years after the 2. Oh. Right? Three years after the 2. So, th- and, and to for for better understanding, Josh, this is also the better camera that Jason uses. Right, right. I remember. You, is- yeah, I remember you said that. It's it's funny because I had the GoPro Four Silver for a while. I, mm-hmm. I actually love that thing when I had it. This and here's the GoPro Five. This is the first camera I bought in 2020. Uh, 2015. It came out in 2015. That's nuts. <clears throat> and I think generally what where where people are at in terms of the GoPros that they used, because I I would say that GoPros are widely used in the community in terms of oh, people who sure. who do it more often. People are around this this GoPro 5 Black and the GoPro Hero Session era mm-hmm. up until like the seven. Cause I'm pretty sure Cody has a seven black, which is right here. And then, the is there more? Nine, they're not, they're is not there? up there. I have the eight, it's, have it's, the eight black. Yeah, it's not even updated. But the eight, the eight, uh, given the timeline, right? Yeah, we could say came out in 2019, 2019, 2020 is when the the eight came out, and then the the ten just came out like three, four months ago or something like that. It's interesting you bring up cameras too, because you know, back when featured videos were still going strong their yeah. primary lens on mirrorless with right. uh yeah like dslr or mirrorless and a lot of those guys were shooting on oh uh, just straight up wide angle not a fish eye it's interesting to see because mm-hmm. you know people like stasis would be shooting on like fish eyes and you could definitely see the difference in the way they threw on a fish eye you know what they had just at home as a, opposed to the studio where you had a, a, a standard wide angle, you know? Um, not to say one is better than the other. I actually love that show. I think it's just, it's different. just different. Exactly, it's just different, yeah. you know? You're, the way you perceive it is very different because if you use like a standard wide angle in like a studio environment, right? You have to try harder to utilize your space more. Whereas right, with a right. fish eye, it is much easier to cover all of the space. Right, it is, right. It is much easier. So it, so the thing is, it, and it kind of ties it all back. It's like the, with with the I guess uprising of people that are gloving in in their homes, and online competitions, it shapes the way that they throw light shows <clears throat> in person because it is inherently different. It is it is very different and. It's just interesting to see because I know Josh, you told me that you prefer how my shows look in person as opposed to on camera, but I think it's just because it's also very different. Right. I mean, you know, when you're in person, you're getting the full use of 3D perception. You're getting like the full like quality of color. Um. Yeah. I mean, but that's just also just me as someone who has almost a cinematic view of gloving. Like when I get a show in person, I'm, I'm getting like the IMAX experience, you know? And I like that. Uh, yeah. Actually, let me ask you a question. So, you know, we shot that project video a while ago. How, how did it feel to shoot in front of a camera like that, as opposed to like shooting on your wide angle, uh, on your fisheye at home? Uh, so when we were doing test shots uh, back at the house, it was just it was different it was it was different in the sense that like i felt like in order to use my space better i had to be further back and then do my moves bigger because i couldn't be up close to have the same kind of illusion that i would have on my gopro Mm-hmm, it right. I I because you use like a 180 lens generally, don't you? Yeah, that's why when we shoot on your GoPro, you know, even if I'm like <laughs> here 
it will still like look straight into the camera whereas opposed to mm -hmm. 180 if i'm here like it'll look like my fingers like pointing out mm -hmm. well because the difference is like this effect where it cups right, around right, right versus it cups outwards right and gopros do the and and most fish eye lenses cup inwards which make f like finger rolls look way wider liquid rails look way longer um it adds a different level of texture because of that curvature like there are some dudes that have like the little clip-on fish eyes mm -hmm. that like absolutely like warp everything right like you see this right, like right. little bubbling effect around yeah right right yeah like when when someone throws a whip into it uh a person that comes in here often riptide dude his whips look so disgusting on his camera and i think it's just the way the fish eye also works mm -hmm. i agree i, I, I agree. mean i think it's funny too because ever since i got my uh 36x super wide lens i've never gone back to a fish eye and I've, i have videos where i've done fish eye i even have videos where i don't have a, a lens at all because they, they didn't exist back then yet <laughs> like well they did but they didn't exist as accessible as they are now uh you know i mean and when i actually got one i would i had i don't even remember where my old camera is but i remember take taping a fisheye lens on top of the camera lens because it's the ones that you know that that uh come out of the camera yeah I, it was super ghetto no one ever saw me doing it that's like super bedroom glover ghetto shit. i'm just saying well so on that note, I think that one thing that the fisheye has definitely done in terms of like influence, like the gloving meta, right? Mm -hmm. And it affected like the generation that really like came up with it and since is that, you know, everyone knows that, you know, with a GoPro, you get everything. But I think it really helped people focus on the micro aspects, actually, because with a GoPro, you have to be close. Like You have to literally yeah. be like right in there. Like I really noticed that when I was what, with your video, I think we could say with the video that you posted is like a pretty good example of like you felt more conscious about your micro movements. Right, right. And I was literally like this close to the lens. And oh, like, you, yeah, and, and I was still getting everything, which was crazy to me, you know? It, even Cause... I started learning that with my with my angle lens, you know, I actually have to get like super close into the camera. And once I started realizing that, like my the latest shows I've been posting, they're like I'm super up close, and now you can actually see what I'm doing with my tutting much more clearly. And I'm just like, I need to be not so afraid to get super close, get in, get in the camera. Yeah, right, I think in right. terms of distance, like I would say, Josh, when I was throwing to your 180. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was like, I want to say I was at least, at least like six to eight inches away from the lens. And then when you were throwing, I would say that you were anywhere from one to four inches from the lens. Right, right. Especially since like the way that the GoPro captures it, like a couple of inches is a long distance, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was very interesting but that's all um, about, that's all about the scaling of the stage you know what i mean right 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 but then it's like once we talk once we talk about this and like recording light shows and and all of this stuff it brings on like a completely different kind of culture within right. loving in itself uh because then that that kind of is the same topic of like competitive versus casual Right, because I think you could, you could. I don't think casual would be, because I think casual is like a subgenre of the. Um, I guess you could call it competitive versus recreational gloving, right? I would even say that, for me, when I first heard that, I thought it was interesting because the way I always saw that spectrum was competitive versus artistic not to say that there is an artistic yeah. element in the competitive but with competitive especially with the way that scorecards have uh come about they're looking for a well-rounded show they're looking for do you cover all these bases that we consider like a standard in a good light show whereas creative is kind of the exact opposite of that right like you're focusing on the elements of the craft that you care about the most and really pushing those boundaries yeah well because um 
and that's why I was saying recreational in terms of like a, a broader term to describe all of that because within the competitive scene of gloving I think it is very like clean cut and specific right. but then recreational covers uh you know people who glove artistically people who glove just for like self-expression which I would argue is a different form of being artistic I right? agree the, 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 and the then, overlap but yeah there's there's the overlap and then there's you know cinematic and then there's uh casual gloving right so and I've, I've actually made an episode called the gloving spectrum and it talks about going from casual to competitive and if uh, we link, actually, link up here yeah definitely link up there. so what i would point out is i say that competitive and casual like the extreme ends like that is but there's so much within between that i haven't really covered but those are the ones i know how to define like this is the mm -hmm. most in this extreme and this is the most in this extreme uh, recreational, I would say, would be the happy medium between casual and competitive, where you're very active in the community just by posting your art and creating, being creative, uh, as opposed to being somebody who's casual who only does it for fun, like going to festivals, they don't really make a lot of videos, they don't really post, they don't really engage in the community except for in person and at festivals and stuff like that, which well, we someone have a very can still of that being jump. Well, yep, someone yep. can still be a casual glover and still engage in the community as well. Right, because there's also oh, local yeah. communities. Like there's, there are a lot there of people is right. But well, because there's a social there's a social aspect to gloving too, and that's something that I feel like we can talk about in the future, or we've kind of touched here and there. But it's something that is better for a different video because there's a lot to say about the social elements of gloving. Right. Right. Before we jump too far, I would even say, to summarize, with technology equals more possibility. And oh, absolutely. More possibility means more possible objectives, to yeah. summarize. No, yeah, I, so. I totally agree. I totally agree. That's, like it, as, as it comes about, that's just how things are. Hence, more things. Hence why I named my podcast The Gloving Paradigm, because the paradigm always shifts. And it's always going. To, mm -hmm. There's always going to be a new form of the paradigm within gloving itself. I mean, we've seen it through the generations, from you know, glow sticking elements to actually being more technical, to having more of a combination of flow and tech, and actually understanding that expansion of how these are not opposing forces but components within, within an overall machine. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest points on that as well is or one of the biggest shifts when it comes to the public perception now in the community is like showmanship is, you know, on people's minds because people are starting to realize that that's not really talked about much. And that's where I think people need to understand that's like one of the hardest pillars to talk about within clubbing because it's probably one of the most objective. Like what is that flair? Well, it's kind of a intangible, merit to really find you have to kind of like you know it when you see it type deal well so my my like slight problem with the idea of showmanship is that i think it is too specific at least from 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 everything that i've learned and everything that i've seen i think it's too specific in terms of like when people think showmanship they think confidence right they think right. that that's that's generally what people think confidence, but but I know McKinley's thinking no, I want to see intention. Yeah, that and that's what I want to see too, because like I don't think I don't think a show where someone is exemplifying uh, a very like sad or somber mood, right? I don't think that's going to showcase a lot of confidence inherently, right? But it shows it showcases a lot of intention. Right, and I think right. that in itself is like where people are misguided as to what showmanship means. So, right. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the conversation we had earlier. Like there's a difference between like the definition as opposed to people's aesthetic idea of the definition. I'm sorry, Peter. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I was just going to say to the best way I always put it when it comes to showmanship is basically how uh, Juan said it in Tokyo Drift. You don't do it by talking about it. You, you do it by feeling. So you have to feel it out. So feel it out. 
you know it's one of the things that you can only understand by feeling it if that makes any sense you know? right mm -hmm. because the way i've always looked at showmanship is that it is a very broad category actually that has many different umbrella uh terminology in it that pertains to showmanship but it only makes up the whole you know like you have storytelling you have narrative theatrics power moves like all that stuff can go under showmanship but there's still other things that you know there's it's a there's a long list of stuff that can go under it you know i can point out four different people in the gloving community throughout history that have a high level of showmanship and they're very drastic shows throughout mm -hmm. you have puppet you have jess you have flow and then you have starlight all four of them have a very strong sense of showmanship within their personal style, but they're so drastically different of how they go about their shows that that's. Why uh, I would I would say I would say Justin Puppet are kind of on the same same uh, boat. No, to the I, I, to I would agree. I would I would boats. similar boats. Different. I would I would yeah. say they are. I would say they're different because even because you know. Without speaking for them, just as an audience, yeah, maybe they have similar ideas, you know, because they've obviously have interacted with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they used to be uh, EL sponsors together, but their execution is totally different because you know, just kind of has a more playful style often, right? He's an he's entertainer. A, like, he's a he's an entertainer, entertainer, absolutely. That is exactly, if you're looking to be somebody who wants to be an entertainer in gloving, just knows how to be an entertainer. It is a right. beautiful thing. Right, whereas Puppet has more of like a Dark Lord persona. Like I always imagine that if he was a Pokemon, he'd be like Mewtwo, you know? I mean, I he brings that. on the high fantasy elements. He brings on this exactly, level exactly. of intensity that I don't feel a lot of people really understand. Like, this is something that can be such high octane, you know, an experience. And I mean, that's <laughs> he's one of my ideal trades. Like, that's the show I want to get because every time I watch a video of his, there's such this level of intensity and such power behind it. I feel like for crying out loud, he's like Sammy Davis Jr. singing one of the most powerful songs while sitting and that dude can freaking belt. You know what I mean? So right, right. It's insane uh, for people to sit there and be like, oh, showmanship is just this flair thing. And they're like, well, I don't know how to define it. There's so many ways to define it. You know, it's just like how you go about it, what you want to put out there in terms of how you're feeling it. Because I mean, again, like I at Starlight, right. for example, she's much more reserved and she's a much more of an emotional tone to her showmanship as opposed to how high octane puppet is or how entertainment jesting you know being the jester is as just as being you know it's also interesting you mention starlight in that context because for me like that reservation is also in contrast to the thing that i constantly think about with her shows was which is her placement of power moves right like yeah for example, her, her placement of power moves it's like she charges for each power move is what it is exactly exactly which yeah. you know again very different from the first two but mm -hmm. still within that branch of showmanship and i feel like it has such a more of an emotional impact rather than being a right display right play power uh dynamic that you see from both jess and from puppet puppet being the most extreme in that case uh absolutely you know, and then you have somebody like Flo, who it's not More really consistent. his personality showing, but he shows like it's his moves are what defines his persona kind of deal. It's right. Very it's much like more on the application of his techniques and things of that nature. And of course, as his name suggests, his flow is just flawless in that in that regard. And that adds to a level of right. ship that I feel like a lot of people get to, but not to the same finesse that Flo got, especially during his heyday. Well, I feel like with Flo, like the difference between him and Starlight, because they're kind of like if Jest and Puppet are over here, they're kind of in terms of showmanship a lot more on like that theatric element. It's like yeah, put the Flo the whole quadrant thing. This is how it's yeah, the right, quadrant. Right. Like it's like Flo and Starlight on this side, but whereas Starlight for me, like a lot of that showmanship comes from like the the power manipulation of it. Flo is in the presentation of technique, like the way he presents those moves, where he places it how he goes into one after another like that was his bread and butter for me yeah like, definitely in the way i would put it is um, like watching what, he, what he does yeah 
that that's the best way I would put it. It's like David Copperfield, where it's just look at my look at the things I'm doing, and it's just boom, boom, boom. It's all flashy. It's all perfectly like you are drawn in and you are absorbed into the the experience. Like he's holding your attention. So that's that's the best way I can put flows showmanship in that kind of regard. I where I was it. where I was going with it though is like I feel like showmanship this this level like this understanding of showmanship was established very early on but it generally hasn't shifted from the beginning right because if someone watches a show in person for an in-person battle right they the only thing that they can gauge on is the level of showmanship that they have and and there's something to be said about like music choice at that time as well like right. i don't think i've ever seen a, a a like battle between two people where the music that was playing was fucking lo-fi like i don't think i've ever seen that right i mean i've hit somebody with that well you, but, i know you've yeah, hit someone with that but now. like in person yeah. competition i've never seen them just like throw on yeah. lo-fi beats to study to and and destroy your opponent to like i've never yeah. seen that you know right right and it's also interesting if you look at it in that context because if you look at a lot of not even just early shows but early competitions because a lot of that stuff was coming out of socal like you you got a, a lot less like dubstep and bass music you got like a lot more house and trance and even even more like towards like the modern times like even igc like you still you saw more bass music but you still had that healthy mix of like other genres whereas if you look at the dmv like our competitions a lot of that shit was just bass you know mm -hmm. very very interesting to see like how the, those music choices will, between regions like influences like how you throw in a competition setting Ooh. also peter i'm so sorry i'm cursing so much in this you're no, gonna have to no it's fine i i've i need to be a little bit more i've I like censoring it out because it just it adds to the flavor of the show. But it's right, right. there's been a few times I, I missed a couple of words and I'm like, damn it! <laughs> Careful with the YouTube gods, right? Yes, don't 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 hurt me too much, YouTube senpai. Just, <laughs> just I swear of being we, a we good. We do things by very legal means, YouTube son. We're very legal here, YouTube son. <laughs> curse words are curse words are not illegal. Uh, Don't worry, this is not the Joe Rogan experience. Mm-hmm, I heard that. I wish I didn't hear that, but I just heard that. We're good. Oh my god. Right, <laughs> right. We I, are good. I, I mean, for quite a lot, I, I had my, apparently my, my, I've had episodes been fact-checked twice. And I still have, like, the screenshot of the notification on Facebook. And still don't know what was fact-checked, because they won't show me. Oh my god. I think So I think we've covered everything that at least I had to talk about cuz we've we've talked about we've we've kind of been doing this like little looping around and rolling tangents. Yeah. Yeah. Through through throughout everything. But yeah, it's like I said in it this conversation is interesting in the sense that we all pull from very different point of views because like even though mckinley's been gloving for a long time he wasn't in the main he community perspective. yeah he had a dance perspective and also wasn't in the main gloving community until 2015 17 17 that's when i became a, i would say i joined glover's lounge at the end of 2018 i became aware of it at the end like somewhere in 2017 okay yeah, so yeah I even didn't... even yeah. then like you you have a old gen perspective but you're coming in As during a during like <laughs> a, a, a new school time school. new gen time and it's really interesting to see yeah i but definitely yeah. would agree um it's one of those things that i feel like you, we, we can talk for hours on it and it's just because there's so much it. Oh, I mean, yeah, gloving as a whole, there's so much to talk about. There's there's a lot to talk about. The scorecard one, that's gonna be quite that's, the discussion. Yep, I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Well, because like me, you know, as as a teaser, I guess. Well, like you could, I guess you could clip like here, and it could be the supplementary footage that you could use for later. Right. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Uh... 
So yeah, do the do the outro, Peter. Do the outro, and then Rick and Morty reference after the outro. <laughs> Like right here. You f***ed with squirrels, Morty. We got a good five minutes before they're backing up on our ass, Morty. I want to see the Spongle. The Spongle reference. Uh, <laughs> I have not seen that one, but I'm probably going to... I'll find it. Don't worry. The, sh um, the Spongle? I, on Rick and Morty? Yeah, it's the little... Is it? Is it not the Spongle? Is it something else? I think it's else. I'm not sure. I don't know. Just, I'm gonna just do the outro. We'll figure it out. All right, we'll figure all it right. out. So, if you guys enjoyed what we had to say, we definitely would like to hear from you guys. Do not hesitate to comment in the comment section down below, or you can head up up at any of our social media outlets. We have it all linked in the description below. And of course, if you guys have not joined the Worldwide Global Discord, which is this is where it's being recorded, please do so. Join. This is where everything is happening. This is where a lot more activity in terms of global community. Uh, activities are actually happening not just on Facebook anymore so please please don't hesitate to do that of course it will also be linked in the description please do not hesitate to support worldwide lovers on their ko-fi you can also do mine if you want as well I'm just saying <laughs> uh, but yes please do not hesitate to show any form of support and of course if you want every free it's not outlet, the spongle it's the plumbus that's what it was oh the, the plumbus. plumbus oh yes you mean you mean something like this yes I, I got it <laughs> there, there's the Rick and Morty reference. We're good. <laughs> uh, other than that, I certainly hope you guys enjoyed what we had to say. Uh, I know we've been running on for a good while, but please do not hesitate to let us know. As always, thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll definitely catch you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Now, it's juicy.